In the last video, we saw that when a creature's replication chance is higher than its death chance, its numbers can grow exponentially. But we were left with a mystery. Since complex organisms can't form without replication, it doesn't matter how good they are at replicating if there aren't any around to replicate. So how do they get their start? So far, each time one of our creatures has replicated, it's done a perfect job. They make an exact copy every time. In the real world though, nobody's perfect. Sometimes a mistake during replication causes a new kind of creature to appear. And we'll call these mistakes mutations. Whatever's different about that kind of creature, color in this case, will likely have some effect on the statistics of that creature. The blue kind of creature has a spontaneous birth chance of one, which means that every time step in the simulation, one of them will appear and each time step, each blue creature has a 10% chance of dying and a 5% chance of replicating. So how would a green creature be different? Well, to be totally honest, we're just making things up right now. We're not looking at actual creatures in an actual environment, so it's totally up to us to decide what this change might do. And then we'll use our equations and simulations to see how things play out. Eventually, we will tie this to the real physical world, stay tuned. But making stuff up and looking at the consequences helps us understand the deep mathematical truths that apply to all replicators. Anyway, let's pick stats that aren't too different from the blue kind. After all, it comes from a mistake in a process that normally works. So let's keep the same death and replication chances per creature, but get rid of that non-replication birth rate. So the green and blue creatures will be essentially the same when they're alive, but for some reason, green blob skin doesn't form unless it comes from replication. Oh, and we should also keep track of the chance of a mutation. Let's say it's 10%. This means that whenever a blue creature replicates, there's a 10% chance that a green creature will be produced instead of a blue one. All right, let's look at a simulation. After watching for a while, we can see that the green ones are having a hard time compared to the blue ones. No offense to the green creatures, but this wasn't a very good mutation. It's easy to think of evolution as a forward march through making better and better organisms, but it's actually a bumbling mess that just gets lucky sometimes. We'll have a look at some good mutations in a moment, but first let's add these mutations to our equations from last video. Just like in the last video, the total expected change will be equal to the non-replication birth rate, plus a term that depends on the current number of creatures. In the last video, this was the replication chance per creature minus the death chance per creature times the total number of creatures. Mutation affects what happens when a creature replicates, so to add mutations into this model, we should do something to this replication piece. But what exactly? To think about this, say 10 blue creatures replicate at a certain time. Without mutations, all 10 of the new creatures will contribute to the number of blue creatures at the next time step, but since blue has a 10% mutation chance, on average we'd expect one of those creatures to actually come out green, so only 9 of the 10 new creatures will be added to blue. We can account for this loss by multiplying r by 1 minus m. With a 10% mutation chance, 90% of blue replications will convert into blue creatures. Alright, what about the equation for green creatures? Again, we'll start with the equation from last video, but before we do anything else, notice how we're using the same symbols in both equations. The equations are actually talking about different kinds of creatures though, so let's add some labels to keep things straight. Okay, because the green creatures aren't mutating, we'll leave the replication chance alone in this equation, but we'll add another term to the end to account for the new creatures that appear due to the blue creatures mutating. What should this term be? Well, if we multiply out the blue equation to get rid of all the parentheses, we can see this term here, which stands for the blue creatures that would have come from replication, but were instead born green due to mutation. These are the same creatures being added to green's numbers, so we can use the exact same expression except add it. This might not seem like it, but this is a big moment. The green creatures can't form on their own, but this mutation term shows how the green creatures get above zero. Their existence depends on replication alone, but in a way they've hacked the system by depending on the replication of a different kind of creature. From their perspective, it's basically the same as being able to form without replication. So even though there weren't too many green creatures, this is a moment to remember. Alright, so that's one possible mistake a blue creature can make while replicating, but as you may know from being a human, there are many, many possible mistakes you could make. 
So let's add a few more, which will lead us to new kinds of creatures. First, let's say blue can also mutate into this red kind, also with a 10% chance each replication. And we have another labeling issue here. Both of these mutation chances belong to the blue kind of creature, so they should keep the label 1, but since there are two of them, we should add another label to tell them apart somehow. The first mutation chance leads to green creatures, so we can add a 2 to keep track of that fact. And this second mutation leads to the red kind of creature, which we can label with the number 3. With that sorted out, this new red kind can only come from replication, just like the green kind. It can't form on its own. But it has a difference. Its death chance is lower than that of a green creature or a blue creature. For some reason, red blobskin is stronger than green or blue blobskin. Or something like that. Again, we're imagining a situation and seeing what our model predicts about that kind of situation to explore the deep mathematical truths behind replicators. Next, this orange kind. The blue creatures aren't the only ones that make mistakes. The orange ones come from red ones, with a chance of, say, 5%. The label 3-4 here keeps track of the fact that it's about creature type 3, which is red, mutating into creature type 4. The orange ones are different from the red ones in that they have a higher replication chance, 10% instead of 5%. Continuing with our imaginings, orange blob skin is also strong with a low death chance, but it's also easier to make more of it once it exists. Or something. If you saw the last video, you might notice that the replication chance being higher than the death chance means this creature type has a shot at growing exponentially. Alright, let's run a simulation starting with no creatures. As expected, the blue creatures are strong coming out of the gate. Like before, we have a green here and there. Okay, there's some red, so now we have a chance to see some orange. And now that we have a few oranges, we can really see that high replication chance doing work. Blue looks like it's around its equilibrium number, but orange is growing exponentially so it blows right by. Looking back at this tree we started building, two of these kinds of creatures are extra special. The orange kind is the first type that grows exponentially. Now that it's around, there's lots and lots of replication happening, and that means lots more chances for mistakes. And that means lots of new kinds of creatures have a chance to develop, eventually leading to some pretty complex creatures. And this blue kind is the first replicator. It's simple enough to form without replication in the right environment, but it's also complex enough to make more of itself. And even though there's never a huge number of them, it's the seed that everything else comes from. So if we were imagining the situation, why did we bother with the green and the red creatures? Wouldn't it be more convenient to just have a blue creature mutate directly into an orange creature? Well, maybe, but that feels a little bit too convenient, don't you think? The real power of this way of looking at replicators comes from the fact that even a messy system full of bad mutations can lead to some exponentially growing replicators. In fact, the reality of how life started is probably much more complex than what we built here. But no matter how messy things get, as long as there's a first replicator and it makes mistakes, odds are good that we'll eventually stumble onto a creature whose replication chance is higher than its death chance, and then the tree of life begins to sprout. We're still working out the details of how this played out in the real world, but we do have a leading candidate for the first replicator. It's a molecule called RNA. The basic story with RNA is that it's simple enough to form without having to come from replication, and yet it replicates, creating more of itself, just like our friends the blue blobs. You might be looking at a portrait of one of your ancestors, which is absolutely astounding if you ask me. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we'll continue adding to our model and we'll break the news to this orange blob that exponential growth can't go on forever. See you then.